We are recording in progress, folks. It's Dr. James and Dr. Mike answering your questions. Dr. Mike, how's it going? Yo, it is going quite well. I am in my last week of hard training. And next week, I compete in a bodybuilding show. People have told me I have to bring underwear and I do a dance and I get tanned and people watch me and they cheer. I like all that. So I'm there. Very cool. I saw that Charlie, uh, Charlie Vaughn. Philadelphia is over there with you guys. Charlie and Jared there. We're, we're filming all kinds of full ROM stuff. So uh, it's going to be good. Very cool. Very cool. All righty. Well, let's get to some questions. Yes. And oh, first. My stupid oh. face. Oh, that's great. What a great place to, to pause that. <laughs> Test 0279 is the name of the man with the plan. Test in my patience. All right, got it. Test asks, is it normal to be resting three minutes between sets of 10 to 20 lateral raises? Strangely, a restaurant two minutes <laughs> between sets of five to 10. For exercise like weighted pull-ups, and I'm good to go again. But resting any shorter for lateral raises results in drops dropping off too much, like from 18 to under 10. Uh, thank you and keep the good work. It's a pity I didn't find this channel when I started training years ago. It's a pity when we didn't have this channel when you started training years ago. Um, it's totally fine. Guys, remember the, the four-factor rest model is when you feel like you can produce a lot of force, when your cardiovascular system isn't interfering anymore, like you're not super fucking out of breath and going nuts. And when you are the target muscle is actually the limiting factor instead of another muscle. And if you can get at least five reps and five quality reps per set, I mean, if you check all those factors, any amount of rest within there is generally good. There, if you want to, you know, start poking at, you know, little tiny differences, you can probably find them. So if you ask yourself, is it normal to be resting the X, Y, Z amount of time between X, Y, Z exercise and set number, are the boxes checked? Yes. Okay. Are you resting much longer than after you've boxes checked? Like you're totally good to go and you rest another three minutes. Then it's totally fine. You probably still get a great stimulus, but you're just pissing away time in the gym. So James and I are kind of fans of as soon as your rest time has checked all four boxes, maybe another 30 seconds or a minute after to really get those reps in the next setup. After that, you're kind of fucking pissing your time away. Um, and we want to get you in and out of the gym, not like as fast as possible because you hate being in the gym, but just like, if there's not really a compelling reason, it, it's like this, you go to the store, you probably want to find the, like in the car and you put the GPS in, you probably want to find the fastest way to get to the GP, to the store. Like that's what usually the GPS tells you. Now that doesn't mean that if you're like with like a new girl you're dating and you guys are going to the store to pick up snacks and you go back to your place to watch TV. That doesn't mean you hate being in the car with her. It might be a great conversation. You might be wishing, I wish this car ride lasted forever, but like it's in your freedom to make the car ride last as long as possible, but you still want to know what the fastest way to the store is. However, if the GPS tells you to go this crazy roundabout way, you may be like, well, why am I doing this? Like people say that you've got to rest five minutes between sets of squats. Well, what if I'm ready in one? Well, you've got to rest five. Well, this doesn't work like that. So if you're checking all the boxes, and if you're not resting a ton of extra time after, then you're totally good to go. And I, uh, from a personal perspective, a lot of times on exercises, they're in a five to 10 rep range. They're so fast twitch and they take so little time that the systemic burden isn't that high, especially if it's a small yeah. muscle group, like um, weighted pull-ups. I literally take two big breaths after and I'm like, I feel fine. Um, deadlifts, I take 50 breaths per minute after for about three minutes and vomit blood. And then I need another 10 minutes to get myself off the floor. So whatever it is, and everyone's different, like you could have really big shoulders and lift a lot of weight for your lateral raises and relative to the rest of you. And that means you may need to rest longer. And it's kind of strange. Uh, it's all personal. And if you check in the four boxes, you're good to go, James. Yeah, I, I laugh at this question because I think we all have like a muscle group that's odd like that. For me, it's biceps. Like most people can blast out biceps, boom, boom, boom. For me, it's I like can't. I do a set of biceps and I'm like, <gasps> no joke. I'm the same way, James. Bicep curls take the <laughs> fuck out of me. Yeah. Like uh, I'm not even that strong in biceps. They and they hurt me so neither. much. Like, it's awful. Yeah. So um, I agree with Mike there. Um, as long as it's checking the boxes, you're good to go. One thing to think about that I often use in my training, not just for these muscles, but other muscles too, is you could have, you know, if you're training, um, presumably you're probably training, you know, delts a couple times a week, hopefully, maybe even more three to four. You could have one session where you're doing lateral raises where the rest is very complete. So you might take, you might kind of embellish just a little bit extra, like Mike said, take maybe after the boxes are checked, take another 30 seconds. That would be like embellishing on the rest. You have very complete rest. And then on another session, you might do it like with a lighter weight 
and actually have a slightly more incomplete rest. And that's something that I do a lot where if I really wanted to catch my breath, I might take like three minutes um, and I'll do that on lateral raises one time per week. And then on a different day, whether it's I'm doing lateral raises again, or I might do a different variation like seated or, you know, standing or super ROM or whatever. I might do it with a constrained rest time where I say, okay, I'm going to two minutes max. And then I just go, go, go. Two minutes is not like incomplete, truly incomplete rest, but it's more incomplete than my like full desired rest. So that's just something you can play around with and have kind of like heavy light variations throughout the week. Absolutely. Next up is Earth Savior, who's actually just blown. Right below, easy peasy. Thank you for saving the earth, by the way. <laughs> earth Savior asks, would you both recommend if you fail to match or beat reps on one exercise for two consecutive weeks, but all of the exercises for that given muscle group are still improving? Or oh, what would you both recommend? Mm. If that's happening, is it best to just deload that one exercise then restart its progression the following week while continuing to progress in all other exercises as normal? Would you only assume that you've hit your MRV for a given muscle group if you plateau on the majority of exercises within the target group? Yes. Yes. That second part of the answer, absolutely yes. Thank you both so much. I hope you both continue to do these Q&As for as long as you both shall live, whether it be eventually <laughs> on this earth or elsewhere. Uh, well, it's okay. Um, if you're just not progressing and you fail to match or beat reps on an exercise, a lot of the reason for that is you were too aggressive in the RIRs for that exercise. Mm -hmm. And then you can deload that exercise for just one session, take like a one session deload where you just do basically like 50% of the load, 50% of the sets, 50% of the reps, and then come back and restart the progression at a more reasonable thing. Don't worry about all your old PRs. Just try to hit new ones slowly, but surely that would be my best advice. James. Yeah, I'm going to piggyback off that one because I had the same thought. So you, typically when this situation comes up, it's because you were too aggressive with your RIRs, meaning you were going harder than you probably should have been, which is fine. It happens. Uh, another situation also RIR related can be when you're kind of going too um, passively where you're like, ooh, like I really strained on that one. I'm not matching reps because that's now like now that's like an RIR of two and I was supposed to hit four and you're like, uh, maybe you were being too, too um, underdosing it from the start. And now you're kind of being like too um, tentative, might be too, too much on the fatigue management side, not enough on the hard training side. So both, it can go in both directions. I would say if I was to point at something like I would funnel it towards RIR, whether it was too aggressive or too um, conservative. Uh, I don't think that you're truly hitting your MRV if all of your other muscle groups are improving, because that just doesn't make sense. You would, you would truly feel it across all other exercises. It would be, so this is what something that Mike and I have said for many years, and I think it's worth reiterating, like when you breach your muscle MRV, there's really not a question, you know it. So it's one you of know. those where like, if, you, if you're not sure, probably the answer is probably not because once you really hit your MRV on like something like a chest in particular, you go to unrack the bar or the dumbbells on a bench press and you're just like, no, yeah. fuck this. And there's a secondary effect that is very interesting. If you've breached your MRV, for a first exercise, you, you're already over MRV. You still show up to the gym. You, you don't know. First exercise, you may muster up way more willpower and way more oomph to actually match or beat reps. And then you start, and it takes everything out of you. You start your second exercise and your potentiation weight feels like you can only do it for two reps and if you're going to failure. You try your set that you last time, last week you did nine and you get five and the bar falls and you're like, okay. Yeah. So, but technically you didn't underperform on every exercise. Well, you had to go to hell and high water to save one. And that cost you so much with the other, like you're fucking done. So that's that. Yeah, it's kind of one of those you'll know situations. Yeah. Either either you're having to like summon Thor's hammer to do anything or you just you just can't do anything. Yep. Next up, Forest Nash Fitness. Oh, another another consistent deliverer of excellent questions. All right. Got it. Holy question. Hi Docs, wishing you both a safe and a happy holiday season. My question is this, to what extent if any does standing slash being in one's feet a lot interfere with leg hypertrophy? I work from home and have an adequate sit slash stand desk in my computer. I try to stand as much as possible when I use a computer in order to avoid any potential negative health effects from extended periods of sitting. Okay. So I, I just tell you straight up, I'm in a bit of a mood today, so I'll be more curt. Almost <laughs> oh every boy, here we go. Studies, here we go. Almost every single one of those sitting studies is correlatory and fucking full of dog shit. What you need to do is move around often and have a high calorie expenditure every day. If you sit when you're tired or you sit when you're at work to concentrate, it doesn't need fucking hill of beans difference in your overall fucking health. The anti-sitting brigade is for people who don't get any a goddamn exercise. Yes. I have a personal vendetta against the standing desk because I can't concentrate when I'm standing. I do no good work when I'm standing. 
And a lot of people, it takes more sort of psychological energy to stand than sit. And then you actually can't do really good work. If you like your standing desk, great. But because standing absolutely costs you actually axial fatigue the entire time, it will sap away from potential leg hypertrophy. It doesn't mean you're going to lose muscle, but your ability to gain it for most people, not everyone, is going to be substantial. Let me finish reading the question, James, and I'll let you cover what I've missed. Um, I said it also because my lower back tends to bother me when I sit a lot. Okay, so valid reason in that case. However, after I've been standing for a while, one plus hour, Jesus Christ, I've noticed my legs start to feel somewhat stiff and slightly achy, almost a very minor pumped feeling. This feeling usually dissipates fairly quickly once I sit down to give my legs a break. I'm really trying to prioritize development currently, so I'm wondering if the standing that I'm doing and the results, resulting effects I'm noticing may be costing me any marginal gains. Absolutely, they are by providing conflicting more endurance type leg stimulus. Absolutely, that's the case. I also axial fatigue, also psychological fatigue. I realize that for most people, this probably wouldn't be worth considering, you know, you want to grow muscle, so you're not most people, but I'm quite interested in optimality. So we'd love to hear your thoughts and advice on the subject. Thanks again for all the great content. Great question, Forrest Nash. I assume that's your name. <laughs> his, his name is like Frank something or other, just Forrest Nash. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's probably a thing. And uh, what I would do is I would do standing desk for a whole week, like normal, and then do your weekly leg workouts. And then next week, I would prioritize more sitting as long as your back doesn't hurt, finding comfy position, stand when you need to, sit when you need to, and see how that same leg workout feels. And I would do that alternating style every few weeks and see if you can notice a pattern. That would be the real way to tell. My prediction is sitting down is much better. Arnold, quote, um, for recovery, way back in the day, he said, if you're standing, sit. If you're sitting, lay down. Um, Dr. Mike Stone, who is James and I, PhD professor and mentor, if he saw weightlifters of his, especially, but really of any team standing at a weightlifting meet between attempts, he would bring them a chair and ask them to sit down or offer them to sit down because a standing fucking takes it out of you. Like imagine going to a theme park. You don't even walk around a lot. You stand in front of rides. You stand at the airport in a line. Dude, that shit zaps my ass so goddamn bad. It's mm -hmm. difficult to put into words. James and I, before COVID used to travel a lot for seminars. We'd like do a lot of airport stuff where we'd stand a lot and shit like that. We get to a gym that same day that we travel like internationally. Oh, and sometimes yeah. if we had leg workouts, there'd be a lot of leg extensions and some leg presses and some curls. Ain't nobody doing compound shit like crazy squats or heavy weight because you're fucked. It's a big, big deal. It might not be a big personal deal for everyone, but if you have to ask the question, it's worth investigating in that, that way that I just described, James. Yeah, very good answer. I actually wanted to piggyback off of your earlier rant. So like uh, when Mike and I worked at Temple, we had some colleagues. Oh, that's where it's from, James. Uh, well, yeah. So we had some colleagues and I I inadvertently. Remember that sign? Do you remember that sign? Which sign? I don't remember. It was a fucking sign up at Temple that literally had like a skeleton at his desk. And he was like, sitting is bad for you. Don't sit. Oh, yeah. That yeah. was a sign in our office. It, it, the offices all had seats. I was like, are we not supposed to come to work? Like, what the fuck is going on? So I jamed myself really bad at Temple once because we had a couple colleagues and I'll just we'll, re we'll remain nameless at the time. Um, and they were super stoked about like fitness trackers, basically like Fitbits and, um, you know, ergonomic desks where you could stand. And they're like, this is so great for health. I was like, and this was me, like just being me. And I wasn't trying to be a dick, but I, I ended up being a dick on accident. And I was like, you, guys, you realize that we're like an exercise science department here. We're not. This isn't like, we're, we're actually supposed to be programming real exercise for people. Like they should be lifting weights and doing cardio, not trying to like not minimize their up. death risk. Like this is ridiculous. <laughs> right. And they kind of, they kind of were like, health school. they were so pumped. They were like, this is great. Right. And I was like, no, you guys are stupid. And kind of. And they because were like, they asked oh. us, they asked you. They're yeah. And I was, shit. Then I kind of had to back down because I, I was like alphaing them a little bit and I didn't mean to, I was just like, oh. That's the thing where, like, for those of us who come from an exercise or sport background, that's kind of dumb. The thing is, like, our department had a variety of people, for some reason, who were in an exercise science department that had no relationship with exercise. So to me, I was just looking at them like, what the fuck are you doing? And they were like, this is great. <laughs> I was like, no, it's not. Uh, anyways, yeah, I agree with Mike on this, the standing stuff. Um, for somebody like yourself, who has aspirations of, you know, lofty physique goals. Jacktitude. You don't have to worry about like the health correlates with sitting. You're already way above and beyond mitigating any type That's of risk. For people for who don't do anything. It's for Thank people you, who, James. Yeah, who are not active, as Mike already said. So you can just kind of throw that out the window. Now you might find you might find in situations where like you're cutting, where you are taking measures to increase your step count or just general kind of neat 
And that might Which be the something doesn't do but maybe okay. to like a minor extent, or it might be more, more like go and t- take more steps. So like, for example, what Mel will do, uh, my wife, um, she, she, she does this like really interesting thing where um, she does a lot of meetings throughout the day, just like Dr. Mike does. And she does the zoom on her phone so that she can just pace around our house. I do that and, all the time. Yeah. And so that's an easy way of like increasing your step count and just staying on your feet, burning energy. The same idea there, right? That, that you might, you might choose strategies like that so that you could be expending more energy without having to just do lots of cardio stuff like that. But other than that, uh, you can just kind of throw that away. You just, I would say, if you want to build your legs, you probably want to be training as hard as you can, which, and then minimizing the stress on your legs and your lower back as much as you can during non-training times. When I first heard about standing desk, I almost passed out because I was like, this is an infuriating level of uh, what people think it does versus what it actually does. Danny Kerr is up next. Danny. Got it. There he is. Danny asks, how would you tell if you're losing muscle on a cut? I understand the need for progressive overload and volume and intensity during a cut. Your strength will naturally go down due to less body mass. How do you account for this decrease and adjust your training without confusing the strength decreases on RV systemic fatigue? I think I remember you talking about the 20 to 30 rep range while cutting due to injury prevention and less strength drop off as body mass falls. This is the case. Uh, thanks, docs. Um, a slightly different tangent there, Danny, towards the end, but I, I'll take a stab at an answer for you. There's a few ways. Here are some of the faster ways. You should be deloading during your cut, during which you should be at maintenance calories. And if after the deload, your lifts are still down significantly, you may be losing muscle because then fatigue really shouldn't be a factor. Here's another one. If your pressing goes down, especially like uh, bench and stuff, some of that's body mass related, poor leverages, that's understandable. If your pull-ups go down or are stagnant, even though you're losing weight, yeah, that's a good example. bad news. If your vertical pulling goes down, bad news. If your squatting goes down, Bad news, because you're losing weight. Your squat should at least be stable. Even if your squat is stable, it kind of means you're getting weaker, and we'll say that's fatigue. If you lose literal weight off the squat, comes off, unless your gut got way smaller and you're just squatting notably deeper, even still, that would be somewhat of a concern. And usually, it's not like 5 or 10 pounds. It's like 25 pounds, 30 pounds. You kind of start looking like a different lifter. And here's more evidence. All around, all kinds of lifts are falling off. That is bad news. You, When you get your best pumps, even though you look sharper, you look notably smaller. Why did I say that? It's cutting. You're supposed to look smaller. Uh-uh-uh. In cutting, you can actually look as big or bigger. Uh, if you guys check the Instagram picture I uploaded, well, this will be released in a few days, but a few days back, I was 222 pounds, end of a cut, all-time best appearance. I looked fucking enormous. The biggest I've ever looked, even though I'm the smallest I've been in almost a year. When you're cutting, you look more jacked in the mirror to yourself. If you look visibly small, small, bad news. And at the end of the day, the worst way to find out, but the most confirmatory way is after the cut is over and you've had about two weeks after the cut to really eat, rebound glycogen, If you're still notably weaker, like for example, before the cut, you were benching, let's say 275 for reps. And towards the end of the cut, you were struggling to bench like the same reps were like 225 to 245. Uh, Two weeks have gone by after the cut and you working back up through the 250s and same with pull-ups and same with squat, you probably lost muscle because the way you can tell once glycogen is back, once fatigue is gone, you can rule those out and your performance should damn near be back to normal. So did you lose muscle then? Yeah, the answer is probably yes. James, anything else uh, you think I missed there about how to tell muscle loss? Yeah, and this is kind of similar to the MRV breaching issue. Um, ha- having been in a situation where I've done that to myself, it was painfully obvious that like something was going on where I was, not only was my performance like noticeably dropping on certain things, but I was miserable. Like So like your internal regulation on that, you start getting negative feedback like a motherfucker, right? When you start losing muscle. And so that's one of the things that I think it's, it's like, you can do it. And usually like if you are doing a cut, even if you're doing a good job, you might lose like a, just a very minuscule amount of muscle that comes back once you start eating normally, very almost negligible. And that's not uncommon. Um, but when you actually lose like a substantial amount of muscle as a result of just poor diet or training or some combination of both, like, man, you know it. And you're, you're just, you feel like 
ass. And then you go to lift stuff and you just feel so weak. As Mike said, you, you kind of come off as a different lifter. Um, what I did want to do is tie into that last um, kind of point he made there about the 20 to 30 rep range. One thing that we do recommend during a cut is to start biasing some of your rep ranges to that moderate and higher, especially towards the end of the cut, towards that higher um, repetition range, simply because it's just very difficult to maintain the strength in that. You can, you can do it. And there are some movements you should actually keep in that five to 10 rep range for sure. But when you're looking at your program as a whole, during a cut, we kind of would say bias towards those mid to um, upper rep ranges because it's easier to maintain performance overall. Trying to lift, you know, sets of six on squats and bench when you're really deep into cutting, it just gets really fucking hard. I've done Your it. acute fatigue will prevent you from doing a whole lot there. Yeah, exactly. Whereas like you can really hang in on those mid to higher rep ranges. So kind of in the other direction, if you're massing, we say, hey, it's probably not a bad idea to lean a little bit on the heavier side. Of course, you always pick which ranges are your best SFR producing ranges. But when you say like when you're massing, maybe lean a little heavier. And when you're cutting, lean a little bit lighter, just because it's easy to um, have these fatigue effects um, just blunting your performance a little bit. So it's and then it gets hard to track, as he said in the question. So uh, my my general response would be like, you kind of know. I mean, like it's one of these things like once you once you're there, you know, there's no question. You'll be like, damn, I fucked up. The problem is it's too late. Once you're there and you kind of check that box, like all you all you can do is go back to the drawing board and say, like, okay, how did I do my cardio? How did I do my nutrition? And maybe I can fix it next time. The good news is, even if you get there. It's pretty easy to bounce back. Regaining is easy. Yeah. Roll I, Phillips I is can, up next. Oh, sorry. 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 <laughs> Just one example, no, no, like one, one lift that you, like the two that for me that were like so painfully obvious that I lost muscle. Bench, it's kind of hard to tell because bench, like, just if you track bench over time, what you'll find is like when you're heavier, your bench goes up. And when you're lighter, it goes down. Like that's just kind of a normal pattern for most people. But like when you, could, you know, for me, I would do sets of 10 to 12, and I don't do this anymore, obviously, uh, deadlift at like 405. Uh, and then you go to pick up like 365 as one of your warm ups, and you're like, oh, your back rounds a little feet, bit. You're like, right. Oh. And you're like, God, what happened? Oh, you lost muscle. Boom. <laughs> Joel Phillips, right below, actually. Got it. Hi, Docs. You always seem to recommend modifications to calorie intakes of 10 to 20% or 250K cal rather than smaller ones due to user counting slash measurement errors. Wouldn't modifications of 50 or 100K cal still be relatively accurate after averaging up the caloric intake over a week or more? Changes of 200K cal or more just seem to be too much for many of the situations I'm in and seem to put me at a point where I'm gaining slash losing slightly too quickly. Uh, yes, yeah. well, I strain to understand the second part of that question. Yeah, that that seems a little bit funny. I think generally the, the and I'll Michael clean this up as we go here. But the reason why we give that recommendation is because it's it's better to be safe than sorry, right? You rather make progress than no progress. Now I have a hard time imagining if you're making a change of 200 calories per day that all of a sudden you're gaining or losing too quickly. Like that recommendation is commonly used across a variety of different nutrition. Not even half a pound per like, week. Yeah, it's. Uh, something seems a little bit odd there. Now, like to answer the first part, like, can you still be accurate with like changes of 50 to a hundred? Um, it's feasible, but in practice, in practice, Mike and I generally find that no, it's just, it's within the gray noise of just everyday meal prepping and stuff like that. And could, you could feasibly make those types of adjustments and over time, they would start to have an effect. The problem is that most people aren't accurate enough to do that. And then they're sitting there fussing with trying to make these very minute changes, but making no progress. So we would say error on the side of progress over no progress, which usually means a slightly bigger bite in calories. But at this point, you know, like 200, 250, which is like a very baseline, like go up or do down by 250 a day. It's, that's not much. It's really not. Yeah. I have a hard time imagining um, a situation where you're like, oh, I added 250 and now I'm like getting super fat. Like. <laughs> Yeah, that's kind of trippy. Uh, another thing is there's there wouldn't modifications of 100, 50 to 100 kcal be relatively accurate after averaging out intake over a week or more? I think the answer there is or more. And if you spend two weeks trying to figure out if you're at a surplus and it turns out the answer after two weeks is no, you really underdid yourself for two weeks, man. 
arguably, especially as a natural trainee, especially as an advanced trainee, it can mean the difference between you gain significant muscle that you get to keep forever in those two weeks versus you gain diddly dick, as James would say. Fuck that, dude. Fuck that. Let's take a look at the other case scenario. You do 200 calories a week, 250 a week surplus, and you gain all the muscle you had coming to you, but you gain a little bit more fat than you wanted. Getting rid of fat while keeping the muscle is the easiest goddamn thing in the world in almost every case, unless you're pushing to contest bodybuilding, whatever, which we're not doing. It's not a problem. The other thing is a fucking problem. Like, it, it, it's it's almost like, I don't know, uh, this is a stupid analogy, but like, if you have some kind of tool that's designed to go in the water and catch crabs for you, not those kinds of crabs, fellas, actual food crabs, although you could technically, technically eat uh, genital lice. Not those, not those dust boot crabs. Dust boot crabs. If the tool is really, really small, and it would have to grab the crab exactly by a leg or his body to get him, there is a good chance each poke, and you know the water's murky, gets you fucking no crabs. If you have a big ass thing like this, you're probably catching a crab or two each time. Downside, you might catch a lot of water and it's heavy to pick up, but you can always pour that water out. Some with the other tool per grab, use a lot of times you get nothing. And like, fuck that. It's like, well, you know, why don't you use a bigger tool? Like, well, then I'd have to pull up a bunch of water. And the response, the, the analogy is, well, then I'd gain more fat. So what? You gain, you're a little fluffier after six weeks. Take two weeks of fucking easy mini cutting and it's gone and you have all your muscle to keep. That like a, a, the desire to increase calories by tiny amounts in almost every case, and I'm not saying it's the case in yours, Joel, you may be the exception, is at the root cause, fat phobia. Fat phobia. I just don't want to get any, any different kind of fat. If I look any fatter, I'm done. And that's not how you get jacked. That's all yeah. I got, James. And the good news is like, it's, it's, it's good to err on the side of progress. And then you can always play around with it. Like once you know, like, okay, 250, you know, from my baseline, got the job going. And then, you know, maybe I came out a little pudgier at the end than I wanted to try 200 next time. Yes. See how that one goes yes. right. Like there, and you can just play with it and feedback feed forward over time. Beautiful. The kid sky is up next. The kid. Sorry. I need a good rapper persona for myself. The kid is always a great rapper name. I think the kid is one word. Got it. There we go. All right. The kid sky says, Hi Docs. I've heard Dr. Mike mention that although minimal, although minimal, eating more carbohydrates compared to fats can be more beneficial because of its anti-catabolic properties. Although I'm not diagnosed with diabetes, my blood sugar has been on the high range. Every time I've done a blood test, should I be aware of my carbohydrate intake? Would a high fat low carb diet be better for me? So the answer is probably not. Um, most Americans get to be diabetic without consuming excessive amounts of carbs. They actually consume excessive amounts of carbs and fats, which is to say calories. The classic rat induction model of diabetes is to feed the rats cow that is an increased amount of saturated fat. It's not even carbohydrate overfeeding. They just give more fats and the rats get fat and they fucking get diabetes. If your body weight is in a normal range, if you're relatively lean and you're physically active, you just mixed out 95% of your diabetes risk. There is a debate about that 5% of whether higher carbs or lower fats are the trick. And I tell you right now, from my view of the literature, and I've studied this relatively in depth, it is absolutely not clear to me that more carbs and less fats make you any more likely to be diabetic. And as a matter of fact, vegans that do it the right way, old school vegans who eat mostly natural foods and, or sorry, mostly unprocessed foods are natural, Jesus. Um, and of course, they're endurance athletes. Uh, they just really don't have very high rates of diabetes and no higher rates, certainly than people who eat keto, but eat a bunch of fucking food. So, um, really, I wouldn't worry about it. What I would do independently of the answer to this question, which my answer would be like, I don't think it's a big deal. I would do two things. One is I would try a diet of less carbohydrates and more healthy fats, uh, poly and monounsaturated fats, primarily, then get your blood test for blood sugar. See if that really is improved the matter. If it has, by the way, keep the calories the same, then maybe, yeah, the, the, then because, you know, there's a lot of personal genomic variants and some people really do to respond differently to carbohydrates at the margins and differently to fats. And maybe a higher fat diet is best for you. It could be the other way around. We eat a higher fat diet and your blood work comes back worse, right? So that I would definitely try. And another thing I would do is I would talk to your doctor 
about um, being on the high range and ask him if that's a concern and ask the doctor what can be done about it. Because maybe the doc's like, yeah, but this is a little higher than we like to see for your age. And maybe he'll say, hey, you should get a little leaner, maybe be more active, maybe give you a GLP-1 agonist or something like that uh, to control your blood sugar, something uh, to that extent. But I definitely would talk with the doctor about that. Uh, but uh, at face value, more carbs, fewer fats, absolutely is not any more um, diabetogenic than any other kind of macro split, assuming you're consuming sufficient protein and are relatively physically active. Like that word diabetogenic. Um, diabetogenic. It's a like Wilford Bill Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I agree with Dr. Mike here. I would just check with your doctor because they might say, like, meh, yeah. If you if you're like have a healthy body composition, you exercise regularly and you're not eating a lot of junk food, they might see that and be like, mm, yeah, you're on the high side, but you seem to be living an otherwise healthy lifestyle. So no real major concerns. If you're, you know, maybe over fat, they might say, like, maybe lose some weight, come back, see us. And then we'll see how that goes. And if you're like not doing, you know, rigorous exercise, that's usually one of the first things they'll look at with things like blood pressure and high glucose. So say like, why don't you get like on a lifting and cardio program, see how that goes and we'll, we'll check it again. So it's one of those, like if you're somebody who doesn't do a ton of exercise, maybe you lift or you, 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 you're like thinking about lifting, you just don't have a ton of time to do it. Maybe entertain adding a little bit of cardio or a little bit more lifting. If you can find the time, something like that. And um, that's usually a pretty good place to start. Um, uh, got, I got a shout out oh. Peter Karos here. Who's enjoying my posters in the background. Yeah, buddy. Okami. Peter, why don't you like my poster? <laughs> you need something. You need something in that room to spice we it up. Can, we can't. That's the studio room where we film YouTube. <laughs> yeah. Um, cool. Very cool. Uh, Ali Al Momin. Al Monin. Got it. Al. Alom. Al Momin. Why can I? Al Momin. Really Al Momin. All right. Hi, docs. It's repeatedly stated that rep speed and time under tension are very minor variables and that shouldn't be the focus of hypertrophy training. In fact, there's more benefit to pushing the concentric as hard as fast as possible because the additional force recruits more faster fat which muscle fibers, uh, just more fibers in general. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, it's also stated that poor execution and technique quality are the most common mistakes and the primary reasons for lack of progress. Probably not the most primary, but there's certainly something to consider. And therefore, it should be the primary focus that take precedence over chasing weight, eagle lifting, sure, or chasing the logbook PRs, progressive over cheating. <laughs> I cannot consolidate these two sides because they seem quite contradictory. We'll consolidate them for you, no worries. Specifically, I find, this, by the way, it's absolutely possible to consolidate things. They're not quite contradictory, they're just different ends of a pole. So you pick the middle, middle end of the range there. Specifically, I find the only way to ensure very high technique quality, eliminating momentum, cheating, and all unintentional cutting of ROM either ends is to slow down the reps, especially the concentric, and to add a decent isometric pause at the bottom of every rep. Of course, performing these slow and controlled reps with pauses significantly reduces the weights used, as well as the force generated on the concentric, okay? Resulting in an incidental shift in priorities to rep speed and time under tension over weight slash reps. So the question is, so mind you, it's been stated accurately that that stuff doesn't matter and doesn't take away from your hypertrophy. So I think there is no contradiction. I think he's caught up on the idea of like having as forceful as a concentric as possible, yes, which which the research shows is is that that point is to talk people out of doing super slow concentric and eccentric on purpose. It's to say, look, there may be a benefit, a small, tiny benefit of going a little bit faster on the concentric. It does not say that ultra speed concentrics are marginally or even at all more beneficial than just normal concentric. Right. And especially, and I know Mike's going to probably hammer this home, like if you are trying to move as fast as possible at the expense of like a more SFR focused technique, then it's probably a net negative at that point. Right. So it's yeah. like if you could if you could do it in a way that is controlled, you have a really good mind muscle connection, you feel the tension and you get a lot of stimulus out of it versus going like like every single rep, you know, I would say the 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 SFR focused one's probably going to win out even over the yes. more explosive technique. Yes, absolutely. So the question is, how can rep speed be a minor factor while simultaneously being the primary driver for the most crucial factor for technique quality? Well, I can, I can absolutely clear this up. It's not a contradiction. Rep speed is a minor factor so long as it doesn't fuck your technique. So within the range of rep speeds you can do and still pull off good technique, rep speed doesn't matter. So as long as you have good technique, you're good to go, right? It's like if 
you know, if you're cooking, if you're making cakes at a regular party uh, for regular people and all the cakes are delicious, it doesn't matter what the macros are. Nobody gives a flying fuck. But if you scoot the macros to be really a protein and heavy and really low fats and low glycemic carbs and people hate the cake, you fucked up. The first rule of baking cakes is cakes are supposed to be delicious. If you fuck it, it's like protein bars, James, like all the best protein bars on the market today, like Quest. First rule about Quest is they're fucking pretty goddamn good as far as protein bars go. And then people care about the macros, but there are protein bars back in the day that were so goddamn bad. It didn't matter how good the macros were. If people eat protein bar. A lot of times that they could eat chicken breast if they didn't want the fucking taste. So it's like first taste and then whatever. Here's another thing. 1990s like pure protein bars. Oh, oh yeah. My you just, God. Rave reviews. The worst ever made of actual chalk. Um, uh, car pricing and quality for luxury brands. If the car is a quality car, you charge 250K, you charge 350K. Nobody gives a fuck. Rich people want to pay 350K. If the quality sucks, it doesn't fucking matter what you charge for. You're like, hey, I got a luxury car. It's not so good quality, but it costs 50K. Like, guess what? Dumbass. You don't have a luxury car. So... The thing is, technique, you're right, is always supreme. Technique's number one. Within the technique being good, any rep speed along that is good. And as the rep speeds get either really slow or really more like really fast, technique starts to break down. And there's an inflection point, a shift there where your SFR falls. Your technique is great, 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 great. Your rep speed is higher. So maybe, you know, the technique's a little worse. But the rep speed's a little more forceful, and it's just about even. But at some point, the, the technique is so bad that the rep speed increase, at marginal as it is, in potentially improving your hypertrophy, doesn't save you anymore. And that's really the take home. I hope that makes sense. Uh, does yeah, that make no, sense to yeah. you, James? Am I, am I, am no, I that, was, that was a great explanation. If I could do like the layperson version of that, Ali, you could kind of think of this as being very liberating on this issue because really, if you're just chasing SFR inducing technique, you really don't have to worry about the, the rep speed at all on the concentric or the eccentric. And the only times where that becomes an issue is on the tail ends of ridiculousness, where you're trying to just like javelin things all the time, or you're just going so obnoxiously slow, it's outside the realm of productive training. So the idea being like, for every movement that you do, chase the technique and tempo where you think you're getting the best SFR. That might yes. be a little bit slower on some things and maybe a little bit faster on other things. It doesn't matter so long as you're not on those ridiculous ends of the spectrum of way fast or way slow. Yes. Dude, Ali actually used the same. I didn't even read the sentence yet. I used the same term. He goes, and is there such a thing as too high a quality, i.e. an inflection point after which the additional quality in, in technique, I assume, technique quality, improvement is not worth the further weight slash reps lost many things. So Ali, you, you, you said it and James said it, and I'll say it this way. It is a measurable thing if you simply use the SFR proxy calculator from our Scientific Principles of Training, our Hypertrophy Training book. And by the way, it's available for free on a ton of YouTube videos, Advanced uh, Hypertrophy Concepts and Tools. Um, we show you how to calculate SFR in numbers if you want. And then you can say like, okay, my pump was rated X. My fucking soreness was rated Y. My uh, joint perception of you know damage is rated Z. And the highest ratings win. So uh, Charlie Jung actually of Team Full Rom, he had a thing where he started to get really, really uh, interested in really like high, high level technique because he thought like he was okay. Here's how this really started. He started to leg press so much weight that he was like, dude, I'm scared. My knees are going to snap right the fuck off because it felt really weird. And he's leg pressing with a completely full range of motion for sets of 10 to 15, 880 pounds, something unreal. You just don't see like, you know, people say, oh, leg press a thousand pounds. Like, Shut the fuck up. No, you don't. Right. He really was. And he was like, he started to slow the reps down and he's like, his pumps went to shit. His soreness went to shit. His progression went to shit. And after a while, he talked to me. He's like, dude, am I doing this wrong? And I'm like, yeah, man, it's okay. You use a little flacism, a little spunk. You're a fast switch guy. You're an athlete. Move that fucking weight. Just don't do anything stupid, like having really bad technique and make sure your pumps and soreness and stuff are good. He went back to that. And he's like, oh my God, my training is so much fucking better now. And like when Jared and I train with Charlie, sometimes his technique externally doesn't look as crisp as ours. Nobody looks as crisp as Jared's, but like it works because SFR wise, that's his highest technique. And that's the thing. And another, just a real quick side ramp. James and I get uh, every now and again, 
messages and videos from people like, Hey, can you look at my squat? Like, and James get this for clients. Um, what's up, what's wrong with my squat? And we look at it and we're like, Oh, PhDs in sports science. It looks unbelievable squats. Great. And like, I don't know. I feel like I'm tipping forward too much, or maybe I'm not using my quads. Like, what the fuck is wrong with you? It's a great way. I can't tell motherfucker. You're fine. And we're nitpicky assholes. Some people are just like, get it way into their heads. The technique needs to be perfect. It needs to be effective. If you get on the leg press, you go through a relatively full range of motion, you know, ball or fucking quad pump, debilitating fucking soreness, and your knees feel fine, motherfucker, that's the right answer. That's it. Yeah, 100%. And then, Ali, just to give, bolster your, your point here a little bit, um, this is where, like, physique sports and, like, strength and power sports verge off. Whereas in physique sports, what you're trying to do is stimulate the SFR to the best of your ability, which is what we just said. Whereas in strength sports and power sports, yes, you're actually trying to generate as much force as possible. So taking weight off the bar or moving more slowly is really not an option. You have to either be moving faster, increasing the weight and, or some combination of both. So that's where you kind of see this divergence of like physique sports versus kind of traditional strength and power sports. Um, uh, real quick off, off that record, <laughs> just like you did a little earlier, James. Matt C uh, asks below there, Dr. Mike, do you like Madara Uchiha? I have oh, no, I have a, Mike, that's this guy you. right here. Oh, sweet. With the James purple does. eyes. I, you know, I, I have do. no idea who that is until Mike, now. You, and I assume it's anime. If you knew who it was, you would love this guy. He's, he's, he's like the, he's the bad boy in Naruto. Uh, he just he, there's I uh, oh man I just I want to go off on this one because there's like a couple scenes that I know I know you and I know like this would give you goosebumps he just like fucks every, like people think they're the top dogs in Naruto like everyone's like I'm the bad motherfucker this guy shows up and just like wipes out like Damn. armies by himself when just, we like, hang out next i'd love to see it <laughs> yeah there's only there's only like a thousand episodes to get through so <laughs> <laughs> you'll just have to fast forward through that shit i'll, I'll show you some of the good scenes you'll love it he's kind of has like the vegeta vibe it's kind of sad. excellent i love that vibe all right uh our perennial top voted henrik anderson is ready to be answered oh did i screw it up there yeah. you go Henrik asks for small muscle groups such as delts, calves, biceps, et cetera, which are predominantly slow twitch, uh, more slow twitch, maybe not predominantly, more slow twitch than average. Are my reps and other intensity techniques superior to straight sets or is it just for variation? So a two-part answer. Uh, one part is uh, I suspect they are uh, by a small margin for most people. The, the second part is, and I know this sounds like we're beating a fucking dead horse. It's not just for variation. It's SFR, your personal SFR. If you do biceps and you do myo reps and you get a fucking unreal SFR, that's the right answer. If you do biceps and you do straight sets and you get a sweet SFR, you try myo reps and you're like, eh, just make me tired. Then it's not the right answer. So because these are all tools that are very easy to implement, we don't want to tell you, yeah, yeah, these are all myo reps and intensity techniques. That's what's going to get you to grow. That is like, I would say our 55 to 45 vote on probably. Do you notice that's not a very big vote. The real variance, the real application comes to the individual. So try both. Uh, and I think that that's probably your best. And, and then after a while, maybe not that long, you'll realize, yeah, straight sets for calves are dumb as fuck. I love my reps, but straight sets for biceps fucking fuck me up. And my reps just don't do a whole lot. James, that, that point at the end was really good because what you'll find is that even within the same person, you might have different responses across muscles. So like for, for myself, like my reps for biceps doesn't do shit for me. It just makes me like really exhausted. Uh, whereas my reps for calves, like does wonders. I don't really train calves much anymore on the occasion that I do. That's the way I prefer to do it because it gets the job done. So you have to play around with it. And even within yourself, you have to kind of play it with different, different muscles will respond to different techniques and rep ranges and all the, all the stuff. And that's why we say SFR. And I know it's kind of feels like a cop out at times, but that, that idea really does encompass so many of the things that, that lead to productive training in hypertrophy training, but also can be in, extrapolated to other forms of training as well. So it's a good answer, unfortunately, even though it sounds like a cop out. Andrew Taibbi is up next. Got him. All right. Oh, I like Andrew. The oh, here we go. This is James's thing. Hey, docs, where is the line between so called junk volume and legitimate workout? I'll spare you the, the long explanation, which you'll also get. There is no line, it's a spectrum. Things can be more or less junky. 
basically I have a crazy schedule. When I get to the gym, I can only get around three to five sets across three to four exercises. I usually stick to compound movements and add in supersets to get more volume. Good idea. So I often supplement with a few sets of dumbbell curls I have at home, something like two to three exercises, four to five sets. Is supplemental volume worth it? In your case, fuck yes, because you're not getting enough volume anywhere else and because you're probably fresh doing those curls. Would I be better off going to bed at 8.30 p.m. and hitting the gym at Amish time? Probably not, unless you're a really morning person. Morning training blows dick because you're super tired and fucks your sleep up. Is there a joke um, that I'm not catching there? What's Amish time? Or is he just- Amish time is like, the, the, the Amish wake up at like an inordinately early. They uh, Amish people are on- uh, What's his name's time? Jocko Willing type shit. Where it's like oh, okay. 2.45 a.m. I'm getting after it. Every time I check, I'm like, Jesus Christ, man. Does this guy not sleep? I love that on? guy. He's, he was on it's Joe been, Rogan awesome. last week. He was, it was good. Awesome. He, he's great. It, way too uh, out there for me as far as like shit I can do. Um, he goes, thanks, <laughs> fellas. Love uh, the practical uh, scientific no BS content. Yeah. James, any cleanup on that one? What, what do you have to add? Yeah. No. So I, I'm trying to just. So he's basically saying like, uh, is the doing the, a couple exercises at home worth it? Or should I just focus on my lifestyle and maximizing um, what I, what I can do at the gym? I think that given that um, recovery is probably not a limiting factor in your case, just because you're not yep. training a, a ton, you know, understand and what you're doing sounds great. And your situation makes perfect sense. So no judgment there, but since you're probably not training to your fullest capacity, Focusing on like getting the extra sleep or the extra just lifestyle recovery benefits probably isn't going to pay huge dividends. If you can get a few extra sets in at home when you have some free time, I think that's a good way to go. As long as you're kind of checking the usual MEV, MAV type boxes that we always recommend for everything, I think you're good to go. And you know, if you have some dumbbells at home, you can do, you can train arms, you can train delts, you can, you can get fancy with legs if you want to. Like there are things you can do at home if you have the extra time. So I don't, I don't see a problem with it all. Yeah. Um, junk volume, by the way, is, is quite easy to define. It is when and to what extent you are so tired that your system is limiting your performance, not the local muscle. And thus the stimulus is low. So if you are getting those curls in and you're getting great pumps, great tension and everything, and you feel good, quite energetic for them, fuck it. It's great, great volume. Um, if you come home after you know, 12 hours of work and you're curling nominal weights and you can't even feel the muscle and you're just like, Ugh, I can't you got the pink yes, ones going and volume. you're like, I yeah. don't feel this at all. Like this. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Our last question for today comes from, Oh, Sean McTiernan. Oh, Sean, this is Ireland. You focus book. Oh, that is a very Irish name, isn't it? Amazing. He's like, oh, God. Clan, oh, oh, it's fucking Clan McTiernan in it. <laughs> I love it. I love you, Ireland. Take it, take it all the best ways. Sean asks, when massing, I believe I've heard Dr. Mike say you shouldn't lose visible abs. Uh, yeah, okay, we'll take that for what it is. This might sound stupid, but does this refer to being able to see your abs when you're flexed? Them? Yes, only flexed, only flexed, only flexed. Because I do not have visible abs unless I flex them without a ton of food in my stomach. That's the case for almost everyone. Or if it's early in the morning before eating and I'm in a calorie deficit to feel depleted. Uh, what are some good indicators to tell if one is over fat to the point where they should start not, not start massing phase or perhaps even stop while in the midst of one. One big one is, are you so fat that your exercise execution and performance and cardio are starting to limit your ability to get the muscle? Like if you have such a big gut that leg pressing is hard, you're done massing. Um, if you have so much fat that you're gassing out on leg presses and squats as opposed to hitting the actual muscles, you're probably done massing. If you can't see your abs flexed, you're probably done massing. Um, James, any, before we get to the second part of the question, do you, do you have any other ones? That just for fun, I'll devil's advocate. I, I largely agree, but I think you could also potentially go a different route when you are relatively, the, when you're running, like if you've been training reasonably for a long time, and now you're actually starting to get more serious about putting your nutrition and training stuff together into like evidence-based training. And you're, you're running your first couple masses. I would say, don't be afraid to put on a little bit more weight than you expected. There are some, there is kind of a, a, the first couple ones, it's good to get a feel, a little trial and error, and then refine it as you go. Again, progress over no progress is always good. And I think like, um, even if you get over fat the first couple of times, the amount of progress you get is really good. And the amount of fat or the effort it takes to lose the fat is not that much. So um, I think it's okay. The reason I say that is because as you mentioned in one of the earlier questions, this is one of those like fat folk. This is like danger leaning very dangerously into the fat phobia type situation. 
Yep. Mike and I have gotten plenty fat uh, when we have. I got too fat. It fucked. Got we my both body have, yeah. I, yeah. I had like an epic. I remember Alex Harrison, who works for RP, did one of my um the side skin folds, and he just yeah. gave me that look, like, dude, what are you doing? And I was like, I'm getting away, bro. I'm <laughs> fucking man. He was like, Yeah, have fun with that. Um, you know, I, I definitely wouldn't recommend going to some of the lengths that we have, but I can tell you that some of the best, some of the best training and some of the most memorable training I have had is when I was a little more portly than I wanted to be, but God damn, was I getting some good work done. So don't be afraid to go there. Like it's one of those things, like if you're running your first one to three masses, I would feel a little apprehensive as a coach. If you were like, coach, I can't see my abs, but like all of your lifts are like going through the roof and you're clearly getting beefier, making good progress. I'd be like, yeah, let's just keep going with, you have, don't let anything good training. Off of you. Yeah, yeah, as long as you're not like just sloppy and like you know going up like four pant sizes or something like that. Like, yeah, that's getting to be a bit of a problem. But for the most part, like, uh, I don't know. I'm having a hard time with this one because I there is there are reasonable limits for sure. Like, there are some limits, as Mike was saying about like what is too fat or when you should stop. But I also feel that like most people use that as an excuse to not do hard training or to do a true mass phase. They just want to stay kind of like in the limbo between like leanness and slightly less leanness, I guess. So I don't know. I struggle with that one, Mike. Do you tie, tidy that one up for me? Cause I don't know. I think if you're fat people going through yeah. that, you know, going through that, it just makes me cringe a little bit when I see people who are making really good progress, but they're so caught up on the fat gain part. You know what I mean? Where yeah. you're just like, dude, just let it roll. You're doing great. Yeah. If you still have some veins, if you can still see your abs when they're flexed, I say keep going. It's totally fine. If you actually lose sight of your abs while they're flexed, in many cases, I would say stop. You're going to have loose skin. You're going to have extra fat cells. It's going to be a pain in the ass to cut the weight off. But a lot of people are in really quite, quite good shape. And they're like, oh, I'm done massing. It's like, why? Like you can still gain another five, 10 pounds. No problem. It'd be totally great. Um, so don't err on either side of that stick to the middle. And then, so he ends it with, I want to run a massing phase for my first intelligently structured approach to weight gain ever around the start of the new year. But I, I find with all the holidays and everything going on around this time of year, uh, it can be pretty hard to just maintain weight. I'm already up two to three pounds for my weight that I cut down 10 to 11 weeks ago. Well, that's okay. Your mass phase just started during the holidays. It's totally fine. You just uh, aim for less total weight gain over the January, February, March, and you're good to go. Sometimes I get clients who are kind of like, they're pretty savvy with what they want to get out of their diet and training stuff. And sometimes we'll hit like an awkward period in the year where I'm like, Hey, it's kind of like the holiday times. Do you want to think about doing a mass or cut or whatever? And sometimes they'll not be sure, but one thing is for sure, right? Like around the holiday times, having some hypertrophy training is always a good idea. Great right, idea. whether it's for maintaining just for your general health and fitness, or if you're gonna go ham and eat a lot of ham, you might as well get some muscle out of it, right? Like that's completely beast. fine. So, like when I, uh, Dr. Mike and some other people are gonna come out and visit us soon, I'm uh, kind of approaching the end of my one of my long macro cycles, so I'm gonna take an active rest period. But by the time they get here, I know we're gonna be eating all sorts of bullshit. So I'm gonna be training my fucking ass off just I'm so that I don't. Get- yeah, just so we don't get super fat and maybe maybe you get fatter than I planned on, but I'll probably gain some muscle too. And that's a cool side benefit. So um, at the very least, like during the holiday season, like you've already, like uh, our friend Sean's describing, I think it's great to go ahead and go hard on the training. If you're kind of, especially if you're not really sure, like if you're like, I don't, I don't, should I wait? Should I not? Just go fucking train. And if you eat a little too much, eh, it's okay. You'll, you'll get buffer. <laughs> Good yeah. trade off. Yep. James, is that your, or is that your phone? I heard right. that a lot, funny enough. Did you really? Damn. Yeah. Uh, yeah I was something. Off. I've actually been um, having, I, I'm setting out like a, a new habit for myself. I've been having some uh, sleep problems because I'm a stomach sleeper and I, I've just been waking up and my back has been cramping really bad. Ugh. And uh, I've been playing around with mattress and box spring and just nothing seems to help. And then uh, I was like, oh, let me give some stretching a try. And I've been doing about 15 minutes of stretching per day. And it was like instant change wow. like immediately just not waking up with back cramps so and I, I could just, work. yeah i had to so i had to I had, that's why my alarm was going off because it was like don't forget to stretch um and i just do like 15 minutes a day nothing crazy just like awesome. just mostly hip and back stuff and it works i slept wrong on my neck and i hurt my neck to the point where i was having like oh, in my shoulder and pain, like oh. pain in my arm like, like that's how much like my sternocleidomastoid inflamed 
I was like, I was like, oh my God, do I have a spinal injury? My wife's a sports med doctor. She's like, no. And I'm like, fuck. So I had to sleep in like awkward positions for a few days. Like, you know, positions like your body wants to roll over on that side. It's going to be so good, but you can't because your neck's going to be fucking broken. So I was like, ah, this is in the middle of cutting where it sleep sucks anyway. And I'm like, ah, but it's just like, Dude. it's almost completely resolved now. And it's on its way out. And I'm like, thank fucking God. I never take anything for granted. Neck is one of those things where it's like the pain isn't terrible, but it's just like omnipresent and prevents Ugh. you from doing everything where it's like if you had like the, the doctor pain scale, uh, you know, like one to 10, you're like, that's yeah, like a five, but it's like a five that's always fucking annoying the shit out of me. Yeah. I can't do anything. God, did you watch? Uh, we're, we're at the bullshit stage of this one, I think. Um, yes. You watch the um, the the oxy cotton doc, uh, doc little series oh man i just watched that with mel it was really good what's it called uh, it's based on the book uh dope sick dope sick mm. it looks at the how like oxy cotton became like this crazy thing people love those goddamn pills man dude i don't it's it's they really you feel nice and warm inside <laughs> i won't spoil it but it was like clearly clearly there was targeting like specific demographics of people who clearly abused it sure. yeah uh how are we doing on questions are we done for this one we're done Woo. Okay. Let's see. Today's December 1st. So we'll do another one before the holidays really are in full effect. Maybe even get another one in when you guys are around. I think you and I can make time to come fuck and get one in during the fucking holidays. I always have time to get one in. Yeah. We'll get yeah. a few in. Mm -hmm. All Next right. Well, hour. folks, thank you so much for the questions. As always, we have some Consistent deliverers of good questions. I like that. We got a good strain going of a few people who always, man, always good ones. And we have plenty of other people who are also asking great ones. Just a friendly reminder, if you scroll through the most recent Q&A, go through and just start upvoting ones that you think are really good and interesting. Even if like they weren't the exact question that you want, if you just see one and you're like, hey, yeah, that's actually a pretty cool question. Just go ahead and upvote hey, yeah, it. Yeah, that's a good one. Fuck it. And selfishly because it helps Mike and I sort out which ones that people think are the best questions for, for this uh, week or uh, every other week. So go ahead and just upvote some. And then if there's one that's burning, you have a burning desire to know, and it just wasn't addressed, drop it in there. And hopefully other people will pay it forward and, and upvote it as well. And we can get to it. Yep. Any housekeeping stuff, Dr. Mike, I know you got to say James like and then YouTube will randomly sort them so that we have to manually find them oh, anyway. You know, it's been like a, a an ongoing struggle. Uh, any housekeeping? You got all sorts of pictures. I see. How many pictures do you post per day? God damn, I can't even. I've been trying that. to post more because this motherfucker lost his Instagram. But guys, follow me, <laughs> Doctor Mike Israel on Instagram. It's my new Insta. It's already up to twenty two thousand followers. But god damn it, I had one hundred eighty five k. Still trying to get the old one back. Seems unlikely. Give me a follow. I'm keeping this account anyway. Um, so I'm trying to post more pictures because I'm in kind of like a ridiculous shape. Week and a half out from the show. So soon you guys will find out how I did at Masters USA is hopefully I just, you know, bring a good package. Judges will put me wherever and we'll continue on the journey of getting more jacked. Um, and that's it. A big, big, big announcement relevant to those of you who hypertrophy train um, and diet for beginning getting jacked. That's coming in late December. So keep an eye out. That's all I can say for now. Mysterious. Yeah. So guys, check out Dr. Mike's page. He's got some great great uh pictures going lately he's got that nice gym lighting set up and everything too wow gym is Mom, amazing. yeah charlie's looking sounds. good jared's looking good you guys are all like looking good at the same time and i'm over here just trying not to be too fat so oh please ah. you got your right. as a hero back there how can you not try to be <laughs> i know right i i like to sometimes of the year i like to embrace my inner job other times i have to tone it back a little bit all right, folks, we're going to wrap this one up. Thanks so much for your questions, and we will see you again next time.